So culture and politics, what a topic. What could be more antithetical than culture and uh, political power? I would say nothing. Yet, for over uh, 50 years, the process of European integration has been linking these two uh, opposing concepts. Europe, which is, in my opinion, too often considered uh, only along uh, market principles, is first and foremost a cultural reality. This, says, this statement, which is um, evident in a way uh, to all non-European uh, citizens, is nevertheless very difficult to uh, conjure up at the very heart of the European Union itself. So it is important to remember the fact that over the centuries, uh, the word culture has been invested with multiple meanings, evolving with history, of course, and social changes, to the point of encompassing everything and meaning nothing, unfortunately. So um, the aim of this presentation is certainly not to define culture, because we would need a one month debate to do so, and not 30 minutes. Uh, but I would like to uh, try to paint a picture that reflects uh, the EU's conception of culture through its legal basis and policies first, and especially through uh, its external action. So I will try to organize my speech um, following four points, if we have time enough, if not only the, the three first ones. So the juridical and historical background, culture, national identity and society, culture and foreign affairs, and some perspectives in the future, and probably if we have time, uh, the discussion too. So as I said, uh, my point is certainly not to define culture, but I think it's important to give you uh, an overview of what I'm thinking, meaning, uh, using the, the word culture. So I use it in a very general way, uh, including uh, daily life, I would say. I'm very not lucky with the PowerPoint. <coughs> Let's hope it will work. So you have a definition that I like very much. So the first uh, point, uh, juridical and historical background. If we think of the EU's emphasis on culture, we will notice that its political taking into account um, started only in 1993 when the Treaty on European Union entered into force. A quotation, aimed at encouraging, supporting and supplementing the actions of the member states, the famous Article 151, uh, which is now 167 in the new Lisbon Treaty, uh, gave some competence to the EU, but only in a complementary form. So what uh, did the Lisbon Treaty uh, change? Unfortunately, not uh, many things, I would say. So if we consider, uh, according to the, the European uh, or communitarian law, that uh, the number of the article uh, represents or underlines the importance of the article, an easy answer would say that going from 151 to 168, um, culture is less important now than it was in 1993. But I won't say that, because it would be an easy answer, really. Uh, the good thing in the Lisbon Treaty is that uh, a few points uh, were added, mainly in the preamble, um, underlining the importance of culture and uh, the humanist uh, inheritance of Europe, so which is quite important. Some other few things were also added in, the, in other articles, but I won't spend the, the whole presentation on it. And uh, the most important thing that I would like to, to underline um, is probably in the procedure itself, um, because now it is um, the decision making in the Council under qualified majority voting. So as you know, until December 2009 and the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty, all cultural measures uh, were agreed by a co-decision procedure between the European Parliament and the Council. Um, but with decision in the Council having to be taken uh, with the unanimity. So, um, to summarize, from the creation of the European communities until Maastricht, there was no cultural policy, neither even interest in cultural matters. And if we consider the role given to culture in the treaties since 1992 until the Lisbon Treaty, we notice a quasi statu quo. So, um, however, in terms of history, the end of Cold War and the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall, however, brought a radical change in the approach to culture. The concept of culture was expanded to encompass that of identity itself. Subsequently, the notion of culture attached um, to the idea of endogenous development acquired a new political substance. 
So the link between culture and development contributed to arguments in favor of financial and administrative aid to uh, developing countries, as you already know. And lastly, the successive conflicts, notably in the Balkans and in former Yugoslavia, crystallize the link between culture and democracy. They question culture and the rights of the minorities or the coexistence of culturally diverse communities. More recently, social tensions, and uh, notably in France, uh, in the suburbs, um, have become uh, stronger not only on the international, but also on the national and regional or local uh, scale, let's say. And uh, it highlights uh, the need for tolerance, not only between societies, but within them as well. So it questions also the link between identity and uh, self-perception. Uh, in my view, the problem is that little by little, culture has acquired uh, identity connotations to the point of identity being assimilated into culture. And my point is culture uh, is extremely different <laughs> from identity. Okay, I give up with the, with the PowerPoint. So the cultural and identity questions continue to be of a crucial importance, of course, uh, to social reflections. So we will continue with... Uh, a PowerPoint with Yoruba matters. This time, I just wanted to underline with the example of the European enlargement. The point, if we can get it, not this one, the, this one, okay. was just to underline that. Um, so, in terms of enlargement, perfect. Thank you. Uh, in terms of enlargement, so this this Eurobarometer was realized in uh, 2009 just after the, the biggest enlargement of 2007, of course, that freedom and democratic values w was the most uh, important topic, let's say. In number three, immigration was uh, the most important topic for most of people, immediately followed by uh, cultural and religious issues. So the identity issue is present at, at every stage of society, at the personal stage, of course, but also at the community level. So I would refer to uh, Micheline Ray's uh, works if you're interested in that topic because I don't want to, to develop it too much. But uh, what is very um, interesting for me, in my opinion, is that in the work of Durkheim, uh, Bassens, Bakhtin, or even, of course, Bourdieu, don't for, I won't forget the, the French one, culture uh, comes to occupy a privileged position. Its structures and forms linked to specific social and historical contexts um, yet partly autonomous of social structure, institutions, and social interaction. But uh, it also argues that culture involves immanent, uh, transcendent, and universal values. Indeed, identity uh, became a major issue in the EU uh, and at the center, really, of the debate in 2005 with the ratification of the tentative of uh, ratification of the constitutional treaty and the fear of the Polish uh, plumber, uh, mainly in France, but also in 2009, even in Switzerland, uh, when identity surrounded one more time in the political debate uh, with a public vote about uh, minarets. So when you put immigration and national identity, the problem is that uh, if you put them side by side, it creates the notion that immigration poses a threat uh, to national identity, which can, of course, uh, inspire racism. So as Mr. Malos uh, said before, I don't see him anymore, uh, as Mr. Malos just said uh, before uh, regarding the, the example of, of France and um, instead of, uh, as Mr. Uh, Sarkozy did, uh, talking or asking about a definition of French or what is French or Frenchness, instead of this uh, fruitless question, it would have been, in my opinion, much more interesting to uh, launch the debate about uh, Europeanness and uh, European citizenship. No, personal uh, statements that we can, of course, discuss later. So, as you know, Europe and all the more European culture in as in diversity. I used to define it as a kaleidoscopic culture nourished uh, by the diversity of national, regional uh, cultures, of course, but also the different languages and identities themselves, including those of the minorities. Yeah, never mind, I will continue. 
So the second point was uh, the role of culture in foreign affairs. So since uh, 1975, the European community has developed various relations with third countries, as you know, uh, in terms of association, cooperation, and partnership. So um, since the first convention of Lomé, 1975, uh, cultural rights have appeared uh, imposing culture as a factor determining external cooperation. And uh, more or less at the same time, the cultural dimension uh, has become also a major issue in terms of economy policy uh, with the battle of the gate and currently in the framework of WTO. Uh, to, but the, um, the question is, um, instead of fighting for um, a kind of European exception or cultural exception, uh, the goal wasn't it more purely economic or political, let's say. This is a, a question that uh, I'm wondering that. And, um, along the same lines, in the field of European integration, culture deprived of a real recognition is of utmost importance. The latest enlargement led us to conclude that most of the obstacles that oppose EU enlargement to include certain countries derive from an identity-oriented interpretation of culture. But another problem so was how to define uh, Europeanness, let's say. And um, when the European Commission asked after the, the first uh, enlargement, yes, oh, we have the good slide, great. Don't touch it. <laughs> Um, so, when the European Commission asked about the negative consequences of the integration uh, of the new countries, 64% of the EU respondents consider that enlargement has caused uh, problems because of the divergent cultural traditions of the member states. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. So, you have some other interesting results and questions that you can read. So, reluctances and disagreements that arise from the moment one touches culture, let's say, are based on a set of factors, often rooted in incompression, ignorance, or simply semantic confusion. Uh, the examples are, um, the most important examples are probably Turkey or the debate about constitutions that we already talked about. And all those examples demonstrate the need uh, to establish an, a, a definition of culture that we could use uh, as a reference in the eventual case of future European integration. So when we say that culture is absolutely not a problem um, in terms of politics, I disagree. And as you can see, it seems to be very important also for uh, European citizens. So on the international arena, the same finding of failure could be also established. Most of the current conflicts have very strong cultural motivations and uh, terrible, of course, uh, cultural side effects. So instead of uh, using the usual cliche about culture or the artist, uh, probably one of the best way to combat uh, war between civilization would be uh, to uh, give a more important recognition to culture and to provide a favorable uh, ground for many major topics, such as research, and um, also uh, the European uh, security and defense policy. So, um, of course, we can discuss it later, but the point was um, the creation of a European smart power uh, could be very positive on that side. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit uh, disturbed by the PowerPoint one more time, so I do apologize for this floating presentation. So anyway, uh, talking about European citizenship, the question is how might European citizenship make manifest a new model of citizenship, one that goes beyond the traditional relationship between citizen and state? The concept of European citizenship challenges our traditional models and requires uh, taking on board new definitions that recognize the impact of social, cultural and political, ch um, political changes one more time. To ignore the political impact of cultural aspects is to create a blind strategy that cannot be adopted to the construction of Europe. The current policy concentrated in the hands of member states sees culture from the perspective of the nation state. The European plurality, however, cannot be reduced to such confines. 
EU has to undertake European identity and European culture to tackle with confidence and realism further stages in its political construction. So to conclude, the main characteristic of the EU's cultural policy seems to be its very inexistence. This appears particularly paradoxical given that culture has become an integral component of other EU policies to the point of uh, becoming crucial, let's say, in various sectors, some are surprising as a common foreign and security policy. The European culture, if it should be possible to define it and recognize it one day, should be framed by policies in its image, revealing its essence, that is kaleidoscopic culture. Thank you very much and for your patience and sorry for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you please, questions or comments? Please. Yes, thank you. Most of this meeting is, is actually used to uh, discuss this really enormous concept of European identity. We've really looked so far at this from so many perspectives. And um, I know like I had some discussions. I know I'm going back home. It kind of stays in my, in my mind. And I actually started wondering, um, you know, like why we in Europe uh, cannot try uh, to adopt, you know, this kind of American tendency to be optimistic about things, you know, like, you know, we, you know, let's work on it, let, let's fix it, uh, let's fix it, uh, you know, to see some potential in it, like, how to overcome maybe this, this European tendency to see, for example, um, an attempt to create a common, you know, something, well, a common identity, European identity, that is inclusive of others, um, uh, like, how to start seeing it as a potential for the future, rather than a problem and a burden, apparently, as it, is, as it tends to be seen. Thank you. My idea would be not to define a common European identity, because I do believe that the concept of identity is very tricky and also dangerous, but a common European culture, let's say, just to recognize it, to be able to recognize it, and maybe to be able uh, to create a common European citizenship, I would say. It could seem a little bit difficult maybe to make the difference or not very useful to make the difference, but, but it is. Because the Id identity, um, identity, one more time, is very dangerous. But just to, I, I had the same um, discussion yesterday with uh, one of the MEPs that uh, we talked, I don't remember, uh, Mrs. Nate uh, Witterbrook. We had exactly the, the same conversation yesterday. And she said that probably things uh, would be easier if we were able, and if political and governments were able to make things simpler in a way. And just to explain people that it's not incompatible to be French, for instance, and European at the same time. And I think this is exactly what we need, just to be simpler and not to all the time I blame Brussels or the EU and making from, from Europe and European uh, citizenship or European identity, never mind the, the way you decide to call it, but just to explain that it's not a big monster, it is very simple and it is absolutely compatible with your regional or national uh, identity. So that's all. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Vilma from Albania. Um, just hearing from your words, I want to know why the identity, European identity for you is dangerous. Considering I'm coming from a country, Canada to be part of European Union, who is trying to build European identity. I want to know why it's dangerous. Because uh, the problem uh, with identity is that it plays with values and emotions. And this is the difference really with culture. And if you uh, need to uh, talk about, let's say, about identity, in order to establish it, you need another. You need a kind of confrontation just to establish it against somebody or another country or whatever it is. So it's not including, it's not an including concept. At the, at the, really at the opposite, it is an opposing concept. So this is the reason why. Hello, my name is Romana, I'm from Romania, and I would like if you could be more specific on what you said about the Article 168 or 67 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, which was used to be the Article 151, and now you said that this means that culture is not so, more, such, so important anymore, and I didn't quite understand what you mean by that. 
which is very interesting with this article, which is more or less exactly the same in the Lisbon Treaty. So originally speaking, it was the, the, the number of the treaty, in, the number of the articles, sorry, in the treaties was 128, and then it became 151, and then it became finally in the Lisbon Treaty 168. So usually um, the number of the, of the article itself um, is linked to the importance that you give to this article. So the way that it, it was at the beginning 128 and then 151 and then 168 seems to indicate that culture uh, is becoming a less and less important topic. That's all. That's only what, what I meant. But. Okay, well on that note, I would uh, ask everyone to please assist me in expressing our gratitude to Ms. Ud Jehan. Thank you. Thank you.